Okay. Are we good, everybody? Excellent. Okay. So this is the, the third in the series. And we talked about birthdays, whether they're important or Jewish altogether. And then we talked about celebrating birthdays, the idea of joy on a birthday. And we kind of established that both are Torah truisms, and both are right from our perspective and Jewish. And now we're going to talk about birthdays after the person is no longer alive. Birthdays for one who has passed on. Now obviously what they're doing on Aiden I don't know. And they're not asking me. <laughs> the question is, what should we do for loved ones or people who we revered who have passed on? May we celebrate their birthdays? Is it silly to celebrate the birthday? Is, is the birthday basically undone once the day of passing comes? These are the kinds of questions that I think people would rightfully ask, and they deserve an answer. So the answer in a word is yes, and we can all go home. And I'm absolutely certain about this. Why am I certain about this? I'm, I'm certain about it because the Rebbe said so. But the purpose of this class is not simply to answer the question with a yes or no, but to try to delve into the mountains of Jewish scholarship that we have been given and try to find the ra reason, the rhyme, and the rationale as to why a birth date is relevant and meaningful even after the process that it unleashed no longer seems to be continuing. So first let me tell you why I'm so certain that, that, it, that it, it is relevant, and then we'll try to put the pieces together. I'm certain it's relevant because, as I stated at the beginning of this series, that this is all dedicated to the Rebbe's campaign for the Rebbetzin. The, the, Rebbe, the Rebbe initiated this campaign in honor of the Rebbetzin, and he did it on her birthday. It was her first birthday after her passing. The Rebbetzin passed on on Chof Beis Shvat, the 22nd day of the Hebrew month of Shvat, some 33 days later, on the 25th day of Adar, is the Rebbetzin's birthday. And I had the privilege, as I mentioned, in the first class of being there at that sicha, at that talk. And in the edited version, it says that this is taken from a talk of the Rebbe on the 25th day of Adar in the year 5748. <laughs> And it says, This is the date of the birth of our righteous Rebetzin. Her soul is an Aden, may her merit shield us. And there's a little asterisk in the printed version. And the asterisk says, just by the way, birthdays are meaningful even after passing. In Hebrew, it should be noted that the concept of a birthday is relevant gam even after the passing. And the Rebbe sends us off to a footnote. And I thought I would share the details of this footnote with you without going into great detail because that could become a class in and of itself. So there's a, there's a mesechet which is called ksubot. And it talks about the obligations that a Jewish man has towards his wife. That's very broadly stated. It's also known as Shas Katan. It's the Mesechet that has everything that's anywhere in the entirety of the Talmud. You'll find it in Mesechet's Kisubot. So, but one of the things which is very much on subject that's being discussed is the, the different stages in people's lives from minor to major. And, and the way monetary obligations and other kinds of commitments and responsibilities evolve with the passage of time. So, Usually, we're familiar with the term katon or gadol, which means minor or major, child or adult, or the term in Hebrew katana or gadola. However, if you want to get very technical, from a halachic perspective, there's a difference between a girl who is a katana, which means under the age of 12 years old, and after bat mitzvah, she becomes known as a naira, which is a young maiden, and that is a period that lasts for six months. So after she's 12 and she reaches puberty, for six months she's a naira, and then she becomes what's called in halacha a bogeret. So she becomes from a naira to a bogeret. I'm pretty sure in modern Hebrew, bogeret or boger is a word. Let's take it from the Gemara. That, that's where it comes from. So there's a question. There are, there are various fiduciary responsibilities that a father has towards his daughter. 
which end at a certain point. And there's a difference between a ketana and a naira, between a child and a young maiden, and a difference between a naira and between a begeris. So this is, for example, just like, for, it's not the same thing, but it, it would help us understand that in Canada, sometimes you have trust funds that are set up. And the trust funds means that the money is not available until the child reaches a certain age. Otherwise, it's the parents who are responsible to administer the wealth. Why? Because supposedly at the age of 18, people will be mature enough to know not to lose all the money, and then we have this idea of trust fund babies and people who lose all the money anyway. But supposedly, if you give it to a child and the child loses all the money, that's just not fair. The child didn't have the maturity to deal with it. So there's a question as to the father's responsibility. If somebody owes something to this child, who should the money go? In, tr in whose trust should it be? Is it going to the hands of the father? Or does it go to the hands of the child? The, child, the father is supposed to be his daughter's protector. So there's a discussion like this in the Gemara. And there's a question of whether the circumstance speaks about a naira or a begeres. And then the Gemara says, here's the question that we had. Yesh beger bekever? Is there the bagrut, the maturity, does it happen even if this is, heaven for fend, a young girl who died away and died is now buried? Ufaka av, and therefore the father at this point is removed. Dilma, or do we say, ain't beger bekever? There is no maturity in the grave. And therefore, lepaka av, the father is not removed from the scene. In other words, this would be like a legal dispute, a legal the question who's responsible for the account? The, 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 is the father still responsible because his daughter died when she was a naira, when she was before the age of 12 and a half or 6 months after puberty, or not? So it's the question of the Gemara. By the way, the Gemara does not have the answer. The Gemara in the end says um, something called Teku. Teku is an acronym for Tishbi, Yataritz, Kushis, Vaboyas. The Tishbite, which is Elio and Navi, will come and answer the questions that we don't know the answers to. Mashiach will come and get the answer to the question. The, the point is not to dwell on this actual subject of whether there is beggar bekever or not beggar bekever on, in, in, in legal, pragmatic terms. So with, is the father re eternally responsible because this is a child who never matured? Unfortunately, she was never able to mature. She was never, never able to grow up or not? That, that's the question at hand. Now you should know that when it comes to halacha or the legality of something, like ownership, we take this extremely seriously. And that means that there are certain things which we might take seriously, but not seriously enough to obligate or necessitate what we would call a, a monetary or fiduciary responsibility. And, I, and I'll give you a little example. This is really like a sidebar. So there's a question in the Gemara about a person who has a dream, and his father comes to him in the dream and says, I'm just using the example of the Gemara, uh, that the money is, is in such and such a place, or in such and such a place is truma or miser. So the question is, is there a legal designation that, the, that this uh, food or grain that's found is sacred, or am I actually obligated to, to pay or to, or, 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 or to do something practical because of this dream? It's a real question. The Gemara has a question. So the Gemara rules, and this is the halacha, Dreams cannot change the legal reality. So, this is the obvious question, which all the Mufar should ask. One second. We have this idea that somebody has a bad dream, that they fast the next day. Or that they do something called Hatavat Chalom. And not only you're allowed to fast the next day on any day, but even if you have that terrible nightmare on Friday night, you're allowed to fast on the Shabbat, which, by the way, is prohibited. And because you fasted on Shabbat, you have to fast now again to make up for the sin of fasting on Shabbat. But you're still allowed to fast on Shabbat. <laughs> so the Gemara says, well, like, what's going on over here? If if dreams are nothing, why is this poor guy fasting? And you allowed him to fast on Shabbat. You're abrogating the, the, the observance of Shabbat. So what's the answer? The answer is, it doesn't mean it's nothing. Dreams are something. There's a lot of Judaism about dreams. It's just that we cannot create legal precedents based on it. We can't have a legal ruling. Is a dream an inspiration? Is a dream a wing from heaven? Is a dream... It's not a question. Clearly you could. You're allowed to fast on Shabbat. You're not allowed to fast on Shabbat any other time. That's big. But when it comes to legality, now that's taking it a step further. So the fact that the Gemara doesn't have the answer to if there is beggar bekever or not beggar bekever does not mean the question is, are there birthdays in heaven or not birthdays in heaven? Where's the take? Okay, so we don't know the answer. 
No, that's, not the, that's not the right way to learn this Gemara. The right way to learn this Gemara is from the fact that we could even have this discussion, whether or not a girl who is no longer terrestrially alive, whose neshama is now in a different place, whether there's still a beggar, whether there's still maturity happening in this world, the fact that we could have that discussion, the fact that it could be a supposition in the Talmud is itself the clearest proof that there is something called birthdays and maturing. Time does pass for neshamas in the other world also. It's abundantly clear. So that's the first place the Rebbe sends us off, sends us to a Gemara. So that's, 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 really it's case closed. What's the question? <laughs> yeah, if we have a Gemara like this that even wanted the question whether there's legal application. I don't know if I'm impressing upon you the, the, the power of that argument that something should be legally binding to the point that it affects monetary law. When it comes to monetary law, the Torah takes it very, very seriously. In fact, it says that a judge has to take a, a court case, which is a dispute over pennies, as seriously as it takes millions. And it says, HaTorah chasa. The Torah is concerned with momonam shal Yisrael, with the, with, with the property, with the residuals, with the ownership of, 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 of a member of Am Yisrael. To the point to the point that the Torah is so concerned with this that we say, Hamotzi mechavero alav haraya. If you want to take money from somebody else, in other words, you're on the extraction side. You're trying to get something from somebody else. You have to prove it. So if I come to you and say, well, I had a dream. Your father came and said, you should give me the money. I'm not legally bound. Now, whether or not you should listen to that is your, I'm not so sure you should listen to it. But the question is whether I'm legally bound. And in halacha, there's a concept called chazaka, which is the pre-ass- uh, pre-assumed reality. So whatever assumption we have to make, wherever the money is now, that's where it is. It can't be moved from there. If you want to discuss this on a mystical and spiritual level, why we obsess over a few pennies or nickels or dollars so much, it's because money really is connected to sparks of holiness and that money is given to us for a purpose and that's for us to utilize and to elevate and transform the world. When you use money properly, (laughs) you could bring Mashiach. Like it says, tzedakah, mekarevis is hagaula, giving tzedakah hastens and accelerates the process of universal redemption. And, and chas v'shalom, using money for the wrong thing, could destroy a person. And, and you're playing around with money, you're playing around with the wherewithal, with the power that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. So money becomes ultimately a vehicle, a representation of something extremely important and extremely meaningful. And here we have a discussion of yesh beger bekever and beger bekever. Whether or not it could actually affect Whose sparks belong to who? Which, think about it in the bigger scheme of things, that, that's what creation is all about. So without a question, is there birthdays in heaven? Yes. And, and the Rebbe simply notes that there are many, many manuscripts, my Marim and Sichas of the previous Rebbe, where he discusses birth dates in the other world. We know the Baal Shem Tev used to celebrate his birthday, Chai Elul, during his terrestrial lifetime. And we know that the Baal Shem Tev continued to celebrate his birthday in Gan Eden. And there's even uh, uh, an entire sicha from the Rebbe Rashab, from the fifth Rebbe, who says that he heard different teachings that the Baal Shem Tev delivered on his birthday in Gan Eden, more than a century after he had passed on. And the teachings are recorded, Torah teachings. These are tzaddikim who didn't make jokes. There was no hyperbole or exaggeration. He didn't say these are his teachings. He said these are the Baal Shem Tev's teachings delivered in honor of the Baal Shem Tev's birthday. So, yeah, of, of course, that's not even a question. And... And uh, the birthdays, birthdays are important. But it's not, okay. So having said that, having said that, here's the question that you're going to receive from people. When you're going to come to people and say, oh, where, where you go today? Oh, let's go to this class. The Kaplan gave a class. Maybe somebody's watching online or somebody will watch us in the future. And they'll say, ha, that doesn't make any sense. Doesn't he know there's an open verse? Doesn't he know there's an actual pasuk that says the opposite? So let me tell you the pasuk that they will quote. And then I'll show you why they're wrong and misunderstand the Pasuk. So the Pasuk is a Pasuk from Megillat Kohelet, which of course is Shlomo Melech's Ecclesiastics. A lot of brilliant and profound and deep stuff which is hard to understand in its literal, sometimes even in its not literal fashion. But this is how the seventh chapter of Kohelet begins. It says, quote, Tov Shem Mishemen Tov. A good name is good, better than good oil. Okay, the Yom Hamavet mi Yom Hivaldo. The day of death is better than the day of birth. What, what are we saying here? What, is, what does this mean? So, the, the the commentary, Rashi's commentary says, Yofila Adam. It's better for a person to have Shem Tov, a good reputation, Mishem Tov, from having good oil. 
And what does this mean? What does this mean? So he says that the, the, the shemen represents something which kind of has the ability to last. You know, like shemen always rises to the top. Oil doesn't mix. So you mix in the water, and the oil will always separate itself. And oil seems uh, to last quite a bit of time, but yet, he says, a reputation outlasts that. So it's like a metaphor. We have uh, the other, the other, others maintain like, um, well, like Rashi also goes on to discuss this idea of embalming, which was once a very popular thing. People used to want to preserve the physical remains and they used this fine oil, a medicinal oil, in order to preserve. But really, if you want to preserve somebody, it's his reputation that gets preserved, not the body. Mind you, they're pretty amazing things they've done with mummies. And pretty, uh, the, 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 this recently, they reconstructed the face of a young Egyptian woman who they guessed to be in her 20s. And it's like unbelievable with technology. They reconstructed, they actually reconstructed the face of a woman who lived like, I don't know, 3,000 years ago. It's extraordinary. It's very nice, but nobody knows who she is. And, and, but if she would have done something amazing, if she left behind a reputation, that reputation would last. You know, we, we talk about women from 4,000 years ago, and they're very much alive to us. Not only are our daughters and our sisters and our mothers named for them, because, but they're... Their, their legacy is here. So it's not a question of preserving physical remains. It's ultimately the reputation that we leave behind. I, we're not, I'm not teaching Kohelet now. I don't want to, I want to delve into this. But I'm just, just introducing the Pasuk. And the Pasuk then kind of moves down into this idea, the Yom HaMavet, the day of passing, Miyomi Voldo. It sounds like a pretty cynical thing to say. It's, you know, the day of, of, of death is better than the day of birth. So Rashi says, he uses the example of Miriam, actually. Interesting. He says, Nolda Miriam, Enoko Yodim Mahi. Miriam is born. Nobody knows what, what Miriam is. She's just a baby. She did what babies do, I presume. She filled diapers. She cried. She kept her parents awake. And that's, that's what babies do. And then, Mesa, when she died, all of a sudden there was nothing to drink. Several million people were stranded with anything to drink because Miriam died. So I said, ooh, this lady Miriam, she, she's kind of important. Like, <laughs> without her, millions of people don't have anything to drink. The Chain, similarly, Miriam's brother, her younger brother, whose name is Aaron, Ba'amud Anan, when he died, the clouds of glory, they dissipated. The Jewish people were unprotected, so Amalek attacked. V'chein Moshe B'man, the same thing as also Moshe Rabbeinu with Mon, and therefore, since Moshe B'enu was, was, when he was alive, the manna was there, and the truth is, the Gemara tells us that both the Be'er as well as the Aran HaKovid, both the miraculous supply of water as well as the clouds of glory returned in the merit of Moshe, and when Moshe passed on, then everything was gone. That was really gone. That was, that was finished. So therefore, that, that's how Rashi says, that's the way to understand this notion that the day of death is better than the day of birth because the day of birth is, is uh, you know, it's nice. It's a beginning, but nobody knows where it's going to go. And the day of death is a life to celebrate. There's a legacy that lives on. We have a medrash that says, from the time somebody is born, we're counting down to death. From the time somebody dies, we're counting down to the next life, which is Tchis Mason. So actually, <laughs> the day, you're, di- the day, the day you be, you're born is the day you begin to die, so to speak. That's, you're counting that direction. I mean, this sounds a little far-fetched to most of us. And, and the, the, the Medrash goes on to say that when, when everybody is born, when pe- people are born, everybody laughs and is happy. And when people die, everybody cries. But really, he said, really, it's not so. Because when a person is born, we don't know how this person will be. So what are you laughing about? What are you so happy about? But when they die, and they die with a good reputation, so then that's something to celebrate. That's something that can't take that away from you. That, that's real. There's a medrash that says that there's a difference. It's like you see with two ships. The ship that leaves, everybody comes. I don't know, in today's day and age, once upon a time, the ship would leave shore. It would be a big thing. Everybody would come and celebrate. And the ship leaves. When the ship arrives, it usually comes in like, I don't know, like 5 o'clock in the morning. Nobody's there to greet it. Nobody, and not just because he didn't know. Whatever. But really, there should be the other way around. You should get a hero's welcome. When the ship sets sail, who knows what's going to happen? It, 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 can't, it can't survive a, a cyclone. If there's going to be a, a hurricane or a tornado at sea, it's over. And when the ship comes in, that's when everybody should be rejoicing. It's a metaphor. Metis uses these different metaphors and says that's why the notion of, of day of passing is better, th- better than the day of birth. So it seems very clear that the day of death is better than the day of birth. Right? So people say to you, what, like, you, know, you celebrate birth, that's, that's the big date in a person's life up till the date of death. But once it's, the, and it's passing, now, now there's a new date in town. And the new date is much better because the new date 
this is when everything, so to speak, was brought home, and everything is, 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 is so to speak, uh, brought to perfection. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's, it says, Rashi says it about Moshe Rabbeinu, right? It says it about Miriam, Aaron, and Moshe. Great tzaddikim. And he gives the example of how when they were born, we didn't know, but when they passed, this one, everything was clear. So, two things. First of all, it doesn't say that Yom HaMavet eclipses or removes Yom Hivoldo. It doesn't say that. It says Tov. It says Tov. It's good. It's better. Maybe more powerful. It doesn't say a birthday doesn't exist. And in, in truth, for most of us, we observe the yard sites perhaps more profoundly and more carefully than we observe the birth dates, which will be a reflection of Yom HaMavet Yom Hivoldo, but it doesn't mean Yom Hivoldo doesn't mean anything. The day of birth is something. Some, it's just that the yard site takes over. The yard site is the more important day, perhaps. So during lifetime, maybe we're more celebrate, we celebrate or focus more on the birth date than on the, uh, the, and, then, and then after one's passing, we celebrate more, but it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist anymore. Furthermore, the Tzemach Tzedek mentions in, in his uh, glosses on the Medrash, and the Rebbe brings this down and explains it in, in one of his early sikhs on Yud Beis Tamas, which was in honor of the previous Rebbe, the previous Rebbe's birthday was Yud Beis Tamas. And he says that the way to understand this Pasuk is that the Yoim HaMavas, the day of death, as the Medrash describes it, which is like there's value and virtue to that day, but where does it come from? There's one thing you need to have a yard site. What do you need to have a yard site? You need to have a birthday. <laughs> like, like, in order to die, you have to live. If you don't live, how could you die? So therefore, the idea of a yard site, or the idea of a day of passing, necessitates a day of birth. It's only that in the day of birth, it's there in a potential state. What we call in Hebrew, bekoach. In the day of passing, it's there in Bipol, in an actual state. So the potential that was given to you has now been actualized. But the potential that was given that's now actualized doesn't mean that the actualization could be without the potential. So Yom HaMavet should not be understood in Hebrew. You could say, Mi Yom Hivoldo, the day of death is better than. Or you can read it, Yom HaMavet, Mi Yom Hivoldo. Where does Yom HaMavet come from? Mi Yom HaVoldo, from the day of birth. It's the birth that contributes, so to speak, to the death. It's the birth that allows us to experience the virtue, the legacy, the greatness of a person who left this world with a good reputation, who lived life as it should be lived. So it all comes mi yom hivoldo. It doesn't say, the, the Pasuk here doesn't eclipse, doesn't dismiss yom hivoldo. It just says tov. It says it's better and more prominent. So that's number one. Number two when we take a look in the Gemara, Mesechet Megillah, actually it's kind of relevant around this time of the year, we see something extraordinary. The Gemara talks about Haman. And Haman was a very superstitious fellow, and I don't mean superstitious in a silly way. He knew that many had tried to destroy the Jewish people before him and had failed. So he wasn't not a believer. He was a Malik. A Malik, the Medrash says, is Yodea et Ribono. He knows his master. Umechaven limrodbo. And he has every intention. It's a mindful and a willful rebellion against God. Amalek knows that the Jewish people are unique and special. He knows it's Hashem's chosen people. And despite that, he's ready to go to war. So, but Haman wants to succeed. Haman doesn't want to fail. He doesn't want to end up like all the Hamans before him. So he, Haman decided that he would kind of take the luck of the draw and see if the luck of the draw would do anything for him. So the Gemara says, in Meseches Megillah, and David Gimel, and Aleph, the Gemara says, Hilpil Pur Hu HaGoyl. Haman throws this lottery. That's better the way the name Purim comes from, from lottery. And it's the Goro. And what happened? What happened? So, incidentally, the fact that it says, Hilpil Pur Hu HaGoyl. Why don't we have a redundant expression? There are many, many interesting uh, answers to this question. I'm going to share with you something amazing, which, is, which Yarash Dvash says. Yarash Dvash says, that Haman made actually two lotteries, two separate lotteries. In one lottery, he wrote a number for every day of the year. So here he was, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, he wrote that was day, day one, day two, day three, day four, all the way to day 364. And then he chose a day. And then he chose a month. 
And Haman said to himself, if the month and the day line up, I know I'm onto something. For example, if he would choose day 50, which would necessarily be in the month of Iyar, right? Because you have 30 days of... And then he chooses a month and he gets Cheshvan, he knows the girl is not working. But what happens if he chooses a day and chooses a month and it's perfectly synonymous? He said, oh, then there's a sign. There's a sign. So what did he do? He wrote all the days. He threw them into this lottery and he picked out a day. And the day turned out to be the 13th day of Adar. And then he picked out the month. And what month did he get? Adar. Haman said, oh, I'm onto something. This is real now. Now, so Tana, we learned in a Braisa, Kevan Shanafal Pur Bechedesh Adar. Forget the, the Goral, he did already. He had a day. And then the Pur fell on Chodesh Adar. He says, Somach Simchok Dela. Haman became delighted. He was very happy. He said, Omar, Nafali Pur Beyedech Shemes Bei Mesha. I have had a lottery on the month of Mesha Abenu's passing. This is a very bad sign for the Jewish people. Why is it a bad sign for the Jewish people? So first of all, Haman made the calculation that the reason that Moshe Rabbeinu died was the sins of the Jewish people. He said that they didn't merit to have Moshe Rabbeinu take them into the land of Israel. So this was a bad sign for them. But that's actually not the case. Hashem decided that Moshe Rabbeinu shouldn't take the Jewish people, so to speak, because of Moshe's sins, but really ultimately because Hashem doesn't want Moshe to be the one to lead the Jewish people into Eretz Yisrael. Like the Medr says, the Hasidus explains, if Moshe Rabbeinu had led us into Israel, game over. Mashiach is here and that's it. Once Moshe and Israel come together, that's fusion. That's going, it goes nuclear. But that wasn't the time for it. So we're still waiting for Moshe Rabbeinu to come when Mashiach will come. Moshe Rabbeinu will, Bezrat Hashem, with his charges, come to Eretz Yisrael. So, but that was Haman's calculation. This was his idea. And furthermore, he said, what happened when Moshe Rabbeinu passed? Go back to the Rashi that we just read. What happened? We had Miriam, who gave us hydration. We had Aaron, who gave us atmospheric protection. We had Moshe, who gave us nourishment. Miriam passes, no hydration. Hashem makes a miracle in Moshe's merit. Aaron passes, the atmosphere dissipates. HaKadosh Baruch is a special atmosphere. Moshe Rabbeinu passes, what happens? That's it. Plug pulled. Now the manna miraculously lasted them another month until they got to Israel, but there was no more manna falling. So Moshe Rabbeinu, was, the month of Moshe's passing, was a bad month for the Jewish people. That's the month they stopped having everyday miracles. So Haman reasoned, this is, this is a really good month. Now incidentally, there's a medrash that says that Haman went through all the months of the year, and in every month he found reasons for concern, meaning good things happened to the Jewish people, with the exception of one month, and that was Adar. So nothing good happened in Adar to them. What good happened in Cheshvan to them? So it says that he made a calculation that Sarah Imenu passed on. Which of course you could ask the obvious question. It, why would Sarah Imenu's passing be a good event for Sarah Imenu and be a bad event when it's Moshe's passing? So the Mepharshim say simple. Number one, Sarah Imenu passed on because of the Akedah, because of her cleaving to Hashem. She passed on in the wings of a mitzvah. Whereas in his calculation, Moshe Rabbeinu passed on on the, on, the, on the slippery slope of an Aveda, in his calculation, number one. Number two, he said, Sarah's passing, she was immediately replaced. What happens after? It says, Yitzchak brought Rivka, Ha'ohala, the Hi'imo, it's this candles, the atmosphere. So, so Sarah was replaced. But it says, look, come, Navi Oid Kemesha. It's never been another Mesha. It says, ah, you see, what Sarah was, that was replaceable, but Mesha's not replaceable. And lastly, bad things happened for the Jewish people when Moshe passed. They lost all this nourishment. They lost all this hydration. They lost the atmosphere. When Sarah passed on, nothing was lost. So anyway, he makes his calculation. That this, is, this is wonderful. This is great. This means that I am now going to be able to carry out my nefarious plans. So what happens? But he didn't know, says the Gemara. Shebeshiva b'chodesh adar. Pardon me. Shiva ba'adar meis, shiva ba'adar neilad. Indeed, Moshe Rabbeinu passed on the seventh day of Adar, but he also was born in the seventh day of Adar. So, incidentally, why is he so happy about Moshe's passing on the thirteenth day of Adar? And the answer was because that's when he reasoned Moshe Rabbeinu's shiva ended. He said it's still in the shiva. Since it's still in the shiva, it still has the long shadow of his passing. Of course, one could argue that from the birth, there's still till the bris also. 
talked about in previous classes. Some people used to make celebrations of the day of the bris. But anyway, that, he focused only on the passion. So Rashi, who guides us along here in the Gemara, says the following. He says, he, he demonstrates the, the proof that the, the day of Moshe's passing had to have been the seventh day because the day they crossed the Yardin, the Jordan River, was the tenth day. And we know that they was a, a, a month of mourning for Moshe. And then after the month, it was three days of preparation. So from seven, the seventh day of Adar to the seventh day of Nisan, three days of preparation. He reasoned, that's, that's, it had to be. Haman could figure out, it's easy to figure out when that was. And, you know, Yal of Nisan is the first day we wake up in Israel. That's the first full, the first full day in Israel as a nation is Yud Aleph Nisan. But Yud Nisan is when we cross over. All right, fine. So he dies on the seventh day. And the B'shiv of the Meitzach Siv ben Meir ve'esem shana anoich hayoyim. And we know the Gemara tells us, hayoyim milu yama yoshnoisai. Today my days and years are filled. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu was like one of those sadikim whose birth and passing was exactly on the same day. And Rashi says something amazing here. He says, and I quote, Listen to these five words. Kedai haleda shetechaper al hamisa. Birth is good enough, or appropriate enough, or suitable enough. Shetechaper that it should. I'm going to translate this literally, which makes no sense. Atone for the mitzah, the death. Birth will atone for death. What does that mean? First of all, you can only atone for sins. What does it mean to atone for death? So in order to understand this, we have to take a look and see where else Rashi uses that word when it's not understood in the context of atonement, as in, not as in a sin. So we have in the Chumash, Pasha's Vayishlach, where Yaakov Avinu has to now encounter his brother Esau. And he's worried about this for good reason. Esau's mm-hmm. a bad guy. He's coming with bad intent. This is, this is scary stuff. So Yaakov says, you'll bring the gift. You'll give some space. Bring a gift. You know, just keep bringing him gifts, you know. Let's try to keep him happy. And then it says, Ve'omartem, he says, Hine avdecho Yaakov achorenu. Jacob's coming. He's behind us. Ki Omar, he's saying, achapra fun of bimincha. He hopes to achapra, atone for his face. What does it mean achapra fun of? He wants, to, ah, he wants to atone for himself. He, says, he wants to atone for, for, his, for his face. What does this mean? So Rashi says, a chapra of panav means that the face of Esav, avato rugzo, when a person is angry, where is it noticeable? On the face. That's like, you never saw angry elbows. <laughs> you see an angry face, right? So the angry face of Esav, he's trying to have Esav's grimace turn into a, like a smile, <laughs> to change the face. And, and therefore use the word achapra. What, is, what does that mean? People say, wipe that smile off your face. Right? Or wipe that grimace off your face. It's a euphemism. It's as old as the Bible itself. This is where it comes from. Achapra fun of. And Rashi says, similarly, we have a Pasuk that says, Rashi brings a number of, of psukim, a Pasuk in Shayo, and he explains. He says, Shekol kapara Tell something very interesting. Whenever you have the word kapara, which in English translates as atonement, but that's of course because in English we have a monochromatic language that can only speak one to one element of the Hebrew word, but the Hebrew word has many elements in it. And Rashi says the word atonement in Hebrew, kapara, is, it means when it's about sinning, it means atonement. But when it's not about sinning, it means cleansing. And he says really all those meanings they're not mutually exclusive. They all come together. It's all the same idea. He says whether it's in a term of atonement or whether it's in a term of changing the face, all of this comes from the idea of wiping. It's like wiping the slate clean. Think about that. People see Yom Kippur, my slate's wiped clean. It, it just means changing, like removing what was so we can now have something instead. And, and he gives a very interesting example. He, Rashi says there are many examples of this in the Gemara. And he says there's an example that says, V'chapar Yedei. V'chapar Yedei is a very interesting story in the Gemara above Metziah, that there was a thief, and everybody was trying to catch a thief. Nobody knew who the thief was. And Mazruta says, I'll tell you who the thief is. And they come in, people are drying their hands, and he sees one guy drying his hands on somebody else's coat. He says, he's the thief. So how do you know? He said, Trust me, he's the thief. So they grabbed the guy and interrogate him. They threatened him, and he, he admits, yeah, he's the thief. So they said to Mazuta, how do you know? 
He said, when I see somebody wiping his hands on somebody else's his coat, I know he doesn't care about somebody else's values. He doesn't respect somebody else's property. He had to be the thief. Because if you respect other people's property, how can you take somebody that belongs to somebody else? <laughs> it's, not, it's not respectful. So, so what are we talking about there? That's quite literal. The guy, his hands are wet. He's literally wiping his hands off. And the terminology used is chiper. Now, there's no atonement. You cannot atone for your hands. Wet hands aren't sinful. And there's another example, which, which is even more profound, where there was a fellow whose name is Nero, or Nero and Kaiser. Now, Nero is a funny guy, and historically, what the Romans say will not line up with what the Talmud says, although there's been much research, and it's not so simple. Ever hear the expression, Nero fiddled while Rome burned? Well, Nero does disappear at a certain point. That is a fact. Nero does not die in Rome, and there is no tomb for him. So the official rumor is he cracked up, and he ran away. But our story is a little different. This is, this is our narrative. Our narrative is that Nero was the first one who was sent against Jerusalem to destroy the base of Migdash. And the story goes that uh, Nero was a little bit nervous about this. And so he began to shoot arrows. And every arrow he shot somehow, m- magically, miraculously, was facing Yerushalayim. It was almost like he was being guided to Yerushalayim. And then he sees a child. And he comes to this child and he says, much like Haman did and Mordechai did, to the child, what's the latest verse you learned? So he says to the child, Tell me the Pasuk you learned. So the child looks at him and he gives him a Pasuk from Ezekiel, from Yecheskel. I will place my vengeance against Edom. And I will make, I will, my fury will burn in Edom and I will get my vengeance. So Nero said, ha, God wants to destroy his house. And he wants to wipe his hands on me. Read the expression. Wipe your hands. Nero said, I'm not doing this. Forget it. I'm, 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 I'm out of here. And the story goes, Nero ran away. Disappeared. Where did Nero go? Nero became a ger. He joined the Jewish people. He became a Balchuva. And his grandson was one of the great sages whose name is Rebbe Meir. Rebbe Meir is a direct descendant of Nero who was like a, an SS officer. A commander of, of the SS forces who abandoned and ran and joined the Jewish people. That's what he was. He was the guy who was going to destroy the base of Megdash. So what happens is he disappears. So now they send a new Caesar and a new program gets put in place. And that's, of course, where uh, a new Caesar is appointed. Vespasian, or Aspasinus, is sent off to lead the charge. He puts a Caesar in Jerusalem. In the end, the Caesar dies and he's elected the new Caesar. And Titus is the one who leads the actual charge against Yerushalayim and destroys the base of English. Again, this is a little bit of a tangent. The point is, the concept of wiping, clearly the idea of it's not atonement. Even when it's atonement, it means wiping. What does Rashi say over here? He says that the birth is powerful enough to wipe away death. Which, of course, you will ask, it makes no sense. It is, it is death that wipes away birth, or undoes birth, not birth that wipes away death. So the truth is, it's a very good question. It's a very profound question. What is Rashi talking about here? And there's a, an amazing sikha from the Rebbe, where the Rebbe describes Moshe Rabbeinu's uniqueness. And he says that Moshe Rabbeinu, it's true the Medrash says a regular person is born, we don't know what's going to be. Even though Rashi used the example of Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam, it could be just, he's going through what we could see. But he says, with Moshe Rabbeinu, it says that when he was born, the house was filled with light. And the Or HaChayim says that Moshe was uniquely suited to be the vehicle through whom Hashem would give the Torah. And therefore, for Moshe Rabbeinu, it says Moshe lo mate. Moshe never really dies. And even though for most of us, regular people, when a person passes on, something is missing, even though the Neshama lives on, for Moshe Rabbeinu, the birth was more powerful than the death. In other words, this Pasuk of Tov, Yom HaMavet, Mehivaldo, even though Rashi himself says there, mentions Moshe in his litany of, of people in the, in, the, in, the, in the Miriam, Aaron, Moshe. Nonetheless, for Moshe Rabbeinu, his, death, his, 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 his birth is even more powerful, which means that death doesn't hold a candle, so to speak, to Moshe Rabbeinu's birth. And Moshe Rabbeinu's birth, is, the other is, like we say, a mazel de kamant, like it's explained elsewhere. We, we learned in our first class about the idea of mazolo gover, strong mazel. Right, so why is we say Adar, of all the months of the year, is the most mazaldik. The valdik, wonderful mazal. Why? Because, because it was Purim. Yeah, but why did Purim happen? 
What's the answer? Because that's the month when Moshe Rabbeinu was born. And the word, in the words of our sages, Moshe who Yisrael, the Yisrael who Moshe. We have a number of times in Deuteronomy where Moshe Rabbeinu and the Jewish people are interchangeable in common verses. And Rashi explains on a simple level. He says because Moshe Rabbeinu is equal to all of Israel and Israel is equal to all of Moshe. So in the month of Nisan, we were born as a nation, but our great redeemer and the greatest teacher of all time was Moshe Rabbeinu. So if Moshe Rabbeinu was born, it's Mazal Gover from Moshe. Who else is Mazal is strong in that day? Am Yisrael. So the whole month becomes suffused in the energy of Moshe Rabbeinu's birth. Okay, so it's not a question that Moshe Rabbeinu, his birth is certainly marked till the end of time. It's not, nobody, nobody will argue that point. And they will say, okay, fine. Tzaddikim, very righteous people. Fine, the birth date is still a, a day of great celebration. Okay, I, I'm not going to tell you that the birth date of ordinary people is a day for great celebration. I don't know that it's great celebration. I've never been to a birthday party of a regular person who passed on. However, however, it definitely is a day. It's definitely a day. It's certainly a day to be observed. In other words, the day of birth is the day that Hashem decided this neshama should come into, the, into planet Earth. Now, when a, a neshama is an eternal thing, so if the neshama was born on this day, it's not just a difference on a terrestrial level. It's a difference on a neshama level. If this is the day the neshama was born, and then that neshama goes to Gan Eden and goes to its afterlife, the day the neshama was born is still an important day. It may not be to us more important than the day of, 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 of passing, but it's still an important day. It's still a meaningful day. And I would say to you, if you would ask me, should you observe the birth date of a loved one who's passed on? I would say, I don't see why not. They say, well, the person's gone. Well, you're here. And you're only here because they're here. Or they left a legacy. So if they were here, and they mean something to you, and their life touched you, why wouldn't you make some kind of observance? Why wouldn't you do something? Because it's their birthday. So this is the overarching general theme. But now I want to share with you the detail that proved to you halachically that not only it's kind of okay, and sure, if you want to, but actually, it's even possibly necessary. It's even probably, if, if not absolutely binding, but certainly highly appropriate. And this is, this is uh, where we're going to go now. So, there's a, a Gemara in Mesechus Brachas. The Gemara says, the Gemara says like this. The Gemara says that when you see certain locations, you should make a bracha. Or see certain phenomenon, you should make a bracha. So the Gemara says, Haraya mokim shanasa by nis li Yisrael. A person who sees a place, shanasa by nisim, the Mishnah says, when miracles happen to the Jewish people. You see the place. What should you do? Oimer, you say, Baruch atah Hashem alakinim alakhailim, although the Gemara doesn't say Baruch, and the Beis Yisrael says that's because when you learn the Gemara, you're not supposed to say the bracha. <laughs> We're very familiar with this bracha because we make this bracha. But and we're going to go back. To, we'll come back to that bracha soon. But when you come to this place, you should make a bracha. Now the Ravid says that that's only the first time you come there. Although many others maintain that it's every time you come there, as long as thirty days has elapsed, you make the bracha all over again. And most of the other brachas talked about here in this Mishnah that is the halacha. For example, when you come to a cemetery, it's a special bracha you're supposed to make. Called Asher Yatsa Eschamadin, Vizan Vichilkal Eschamadin, Vehemis Eschamadin, Vehemis Bekul Chamadin, Vaslach Yeschem. So there's a bracha you make. However, if you've been to that cemetery within 30 days, you don't make the bracha. And it doesn't mean to a cemetery, that cemetery. So if you haven't been to a particular cemetery in 30 days, you make the bracha. And all the other brachas here. So it sounds pretty much not like what the Ravid is saying. And most of the Rishonim disagree with the Ravid and says if you, if you haven't been there, the Rush clearly says if you been, haven't been in 30 days, you make the bracha again. However, however, the rabbis point out, even according to the Ravid, it doesn't mean you shouldn't acknowledge it or make a bracha. It just says you don't say baracha to Hashem, alokeinu melech olam, shasen nisim. So maybe you don't say the whole bracha, with what's called shame umalchus, but nonetheless, it's still appropriate to acknowledge Hashem's kindness. 
But that's really what this is about. This is about being thankful. This is about living with an attitude of gratitude. You see something that is a miracle? Say, Hashem, count my blessings. I want to thank you. I want to acknowledge this. I want, I want to pre- show appreciation for a miracle that was done for my people. So that's how the Mishnah starts off. Then the Gemara comes and says, ah, so it says, only nisim li miracles for the nation. What about miracles for an individual? And the Gemara has a whole discussion back and forth, and the Gemara says, no, no, no. Miracles for, for a nation, the nation says, everybody says. But for an individual, a person could say in this whole discussion what's called a, a, a miracle, but the Gemara finishes off with saying, yes, that ihu chayev levruchi, the person who had the miracle, that person would certainly be obligated to make a blessing when he comes to that place. So when it says, Ihu chayev levarche, that's what the Gemara says, the Rif, the Alphas, takes it further and he says, Ihu uvrei uvarbre, he, the person, the person's children, and the person's children's children. Three generations. And we have this idea of three generations. Where do we get three generations? Because it says, The mercy of a father to a son extends three generations. Great-grandchildren are cute. But I don't think great-grandchildren feels like, like children mamash. Like apparently, the, the family extends three generations. This is the normal human condition. You know, people love their great-grandchildren because it's their grandchildren's children. I think, I think that's the most powerful emotional connection. Four generations is a big gap. It's, a, it's, it's like a generational thing already. It's like an ancestor. But three generations is, is very close up. And incidentally, we have this tradition that, that a chuppah who comes, parents come, and grandparents come. Three generations. Three generations show up at a chuppah. Now, it, does, it can mean three generations of the Chasn and Kala, or maybe from the parents of the Chasn and Kala, if the parents are alive. Maybe three generations, because it's a big day for them. They're bringing their child to the Chuppah. But three generations is the, is, the, is, the, is the link. That's what the Rif says. However, however, others maintain that it's not only for three generations, but the Tur, according to Rashba, says, says no. Kol ad All of the descendants until the end of time. You come to this place, a miracle happened to your ancestor. So let's say you would know for a matter of fact that you had an ancestor who lived in this exact place and a building collapsed and everybody died and your grandfather or grandmother came out alive. You would be in that spot. You would have a mitzvah. You would have a halacha. You should make a bracha. You should thank Hashem. Now the Yad Aaron comes along and says, well, that's only if you were born or your ancestor was born after the miracle. Because without it, you would no longer be. Okay, so I should, I, should commemorate, I should commemorate this miracle that happened because ultimately this miracle that happened is not just a miracle of something that happened, but rather this miracle is a miracle that is happening. Why is it happening? Because I'm here. Okay. So let's think about the the birthday idea. The birthday, we talk about this is about a place, about space. When you come to a space, you say, in this space, a miracle happened. The Rebbe says, tell me, time is nothing? When you come to space, you make a bracha. And what about time? We know that Hashem first created time, and then He created space. If you want to boil time and space down to its bare bones, its organic essence, what is it all about in one word? You see, you can only be in the present. You cannot be in the past and in the future unless you're reading some kind of weird stuff out there. But (laughs) for normal people, you can only be in one time at one time. You can only be, you can only be here now. You can't be somewhere, you can't be in a different time. Why? Because time is, the buzzword is sequential. Time is sequential. In order to get here, I had to, be, I had to be there a moment before. If I wouldn't be there the moment before, I wouldn't be here now. Or there's a moment when things begin. And now I can be here, and I can't get to the future without leaving this behind, because that's the nature of sequence. If I'm going to sequence, if I go to another time, I first have to leave this time behind, and then I go to the next time. So everything creation begins with sequence. And then sequence evolved, or not randomly, but by choreograph of, of the creator, from time it evolves into space. What does space mean? Space is the limitation where I can only be here at one time. 
Precisely because time is sequential, space becomes sequential. Space is here and not there. There and not somewhere else. So when I come to the space, the makom, where a miracle happened, what should I do? What's the appropriate thing to do? I should make a bracha. Why? What do you mean? A miracle happened to my ancestor at this spot. Incidentally, this is halacha lemaisa. The Alter Rebbe says in the 13th chapter of Birchus HaNenen, he says clearly that yachid shenasa le'neis be'ezim makim, an individual from whom a miracle happens at a certain place. For example, nafalal of koysel, a wall collapsed, a building collapsed, and he's saved, or he's thrown into like wild animals come, and usually bears and lions don't play games. Or list them armed robbers who usually take the prisoners. And then somehow he was he escaped. Chayev hu atzma. He himself is obligated. When you see, even if you're not in that place, when you see that place, you can ident- see that place, you have to make a bracha al achash leshim. If 30 days have elapsed, and he goes on baracha ta Hashem, alakinim al chayelim, sha'asali nesam makamazim. Okay. Then he says, a few paragraphs later, V'chol yotzei yirecho shal osa adam. All of the descendants of that person. That the miracle happened in that place. Imhanes yodua al pihamakum. If we know the place. So for example, it's a family tradition. We pass on. Yet, yeah, grandma was here. The fire came down. Everybody died in the fire. And she was somehow emerged unscathed. And nobody could explain it. Then we come back to that place. It could be generations later. You know how long he says? Ad soif kol hadaris. Till the end of all time. So if you know for a fact you're descended from from famous man or woman from a thousand years ago, and this is, people can know these things, and there's a miracle that happened to that ancestor, you could have tens of thousands of descendants. doesn't matter. When you're in that place, you have a sacred duty to make a bracha and thank Hashem. Kishadoyim hamakim, when you see the place. So the Rebbe says... One second here, he says. You're telling me that when we see a place, we have to come along and make a bracha. So the Rebbe says, Dugmasai, the same exact paradigm is bizman, is in time. Just like you can arrive at a place, you can arrive at a time. Now, of course, I can revisit the same place. I cannot revisit the same time because time is, time continues on. But we don't see time as linear. We see time as Circular, spiral. So when I come back around to the anniversary, well, so think of it as a spiral like this. I was here, then I was here, then I was here. So when I'm there at that time, I'm there exactly at the same time where that's where it happened last year, and the year before, and the year before. And we've already established the notion in our first class that when things happen in a particular time, that the same forces are at play when you come to that time annually. And the Rebbe says, what's the most perfect example of this? From a bracha we actually all know and make. What's the bracha? We're going to be making it soon on Purim. The bracha is, She'asa nisim laveseinu bayomim ha'heim In those days. Bizman hazeh. And this day. And this time. You can't make the bracha of She'asa nisim on a different day. You can only make the Hanukkah bracha of She'asa nisim on the days of Hanukkah. You can only make the bracha of She'asa nisim on the day of Purim. So in other words, just like there's a power and a potency to what we would call space, there's also a power and potency to what we call time. It's like a no-brainer. And so... And they ask yourself the question, one second. So if I came to a place where a miracle happened to an ancestor, and that miracle allowed me to be able to exist, I should make a bracha and I should thank Hashem. Well, if my ancestor was born on this day, if my ancestor had not been born, where would I be? <laughs> like, where would I be? I wouldn't be. So if my father and mother were born on a certain day, if they wouldn't be born, I wouldn't be born. If my grandparents wouldn't be born, I wouldn't be born. So in that case, their birth dates are meaningful to me. may not be meaningful to you. It's meaningful to me because I wouldn't be here otherwise. But it goes even further, really, because if you think about it, there's somebody you love very much or you care about. If their parents wouldn't be born, they wouldn't be. Well, that means that that day becomes a day of importance. And really, what is this all about? Of what do we speak? What, what, what are we looking for? We're looking for opportunities to say thank you to Hashem. That's really what we're looking for. The Rebbe says, what is the issue? 
We're talking about thanking Hashem for something He's given us. So if you have an opportunity to take an anniversary and say, this is a day when I was given a gift. Because of this day, because of Hashem's kindness, I am, or I have, so I want to thank Hashem. Going back to the Ravid, who says you only make a bracha the first time, but, but the Mepharshim who speak about the Ravid, who say, yeah, the Ravid would tell you you can't make the bracha b'shem u'malchus. Incidentally, the Rebbe never suggested you have to make a bracha b'shem u'malchus, although he does bring down from a number of sources that there were people who would make a point of making a Shehech on their birthday. And because a Shehech is a question, so therefore having a fruit, have a new garment, you find a way to make a Shehech and you thank Hashem for the new fruit and garment. But what you're really thanking Hashem for is, in addition, is an opportunity to thank Hashem for your birthday. Thank Hashem because it's a special day. You know, when, when I got married, the Maizeid Allah Shalom was very excited. I was his first grandson, he was very excited. So he bought a new talus because he wanted to be able to make a Shehech on my wedding. He felt like making a Shehech he was very happy, he was very excited. And I remember him buying a new talus and he told me, I bought this new talus because I want to make a Shehech on honor of your wedding. In other words, if a yid wants to make a shekhi on him because he's very happy, there are, there are ways to figure it out. You know, it's a, a yid gets a We have a problem the second day Rosh Hashanah. We can't make a shekhi on What do we do? See a new fruit. When it comes the next day, you, you have to blow the shofar. What do you, you give a a new garment. There are ways to, to, to wait, ways to thank Hashem. And we have to be from the yidin and we have to do what the Shulchan Aruch says and we have to follow the, the code of Jewish law. Fine, so you do it no way that works the code of Jewish law. Now really and truly, this idea actually is, is uh, it, it would seem, could even be, if not entirely, but even some, it seems a little bit that it's a medrash too. The medrash, when it talks about Pesach, and incidentally, in, in our first class, we talked about Pesach being the birthday of the Jewish people. Now, that's basically how we summed it up. As the day we were born, and Achat Shal Pesach, or the eighth day of Pesach, is like the bris. Right? So the medrash says, this is a medrash Rabbah in Pedic Tezvav, in most versions, it's, it's, a, it's chapter 10. It says, This month is going to be for you the beginning of all months. Obvious question, what do you mean? Rosh Hashanah is Rosh Hashanah. That's creation. Why Why is this day being observed? So the manager said, There was a king who had a son. Okay, fine. And he made, a, he made a, a party. We talked about this in previous classes. King had a baby, made a party. Then he was, he was taken captive. And he was in captivity, a hostage, for a very long time. Also, Shabazman Meruba. Achazman Nifta. Then he was finally redeemed. So that child was redeemed. Also, Melchim Genusia. The king made a day of, like a birthday. In other words, the Yeshua Yankov says, Yom Genusia. Remember, we learned that in the first class, Tobi Genusia. He says, Yom who led that Melachim. Instead of the birthday being the original birthday when he was born, the new birthday was his second lease on life when he, when he came back. That was like his new birthday. So we have this idea of a major event in life that's like a new birthday. He started counting that anniversary. Incidentally, it's, the Rebbe brings down that many Hasidim would count their day, the first day they came to the Rebbe, as a birthday. Same idea. It's a Midrashic idea. So too says the Medrash, until the Jewish people were down into Mitzrayim. So Rosh Chodesh Nisan, they were, they were counting then down into, so to speak, counting into the Shibud. When is the, the fulfillment of the promise to God, the God made, we're going to end up in, in captivity. But now when they were redeemed, they began to count months. So the Medrash is not really so clear. It's not really so clear, but if you look in the Pirish Maharzu, he has a little bit of a different version in the Medrash. And the Pirish Marzu gives us something, an, an extraordinary ex explanation of this Medrash. Marzu says like this. He says, up until the Jewish people's release from Mitzrayim, which is our national birthday, the day we went out of Mitzrayim, he said, up until then, we used to count from the birthday of the world. Which is the birthday of the world? Adam and Chava, right? Rosh Hashanah. He says, however, then we went into Mitzrayim. And then we were like, Almost finished. And then Kishiniftu, he says, just like the king whose son was released. So then that became our new birthday. And because, therefore, until we went down to Mitzrayim, we counted time from Rosh Hashanah. Once we went to Mitzrayim, and we're redeemed from Mitzrayim, now we count time from the concept of Pesach. The idea of a Chedesh In other words, think what this matter is saying, in other words. 
That means once the Jewish people were redeemed from Mitzrayim, right? Once, once we went through that experience, that time becomes sanctified for posterity. Why? It's our national birthday. So every time we come back to this day, we're celebrating all over again. Think about the Mishnah we just learned before. The person who saw a place. You see a perfect corollary here. The Rebbe suggests it, but really it's implicit. There's a perfect corollary between the words of the Gemara, the Halacha that speaks about seeing a place, and the Medrash that speaks about a time. It's very clear. Now, I can't tell you you have to make a party on the birthday of somebody who's, who's, who's passed on. It's clearly, when it comes to Tzaddikim, when it comes to a Moshe Rabbeinu, that clearly is the case. It clearly is the case. But in, in closing, I could say very comfortably, with absolute certainty, A, birthdays are meaningful, even for the Shamas that have passed on. B, there's absolutely nothing wrong, and there's possibly even an obligation that we would have to thank Hashem on days like this and do something special to express our gratitude, for without that day, where would we be today? Our greatest hope and our prayer, of course, is that from these days of importance in the past, that we should be zeichet to the greatest day of all. And the greatest day of all is the coming of Mashiach. And that's a day that, of course, will have no end. <laughs> and nobody will have any question that then we will celebrate the Metz Hashem for eternity. And all of those who were born, whose terrestrial existence was somehow interrupted, when Mashiach will come in Metz Hashem, they'll all be back. And then we can celebrate Yom Yorzeit Svet Sadikim as Yimei Hahilula, days when they came closer to Hashem, but then everybody will celebrate their birthdays. So it doesn't make sense to forget the birthdays and then start celebrating again. This way we can, can hopefully, Bezat Hashem, we can t- as, we, as we have marked birthdays now during this dark time, we'll be able to celebrate the birthdays with our loved ones again, with the coming of Mashiach, Memheda, will be Amenu, Amen. And with this, our series is completed.